Welcome to the Digital HR Leaders Podcast. I'm delighted to welcome Olivia Edwards, Colleague Engagement Lead, and Louise Miller, People Director from Chetwood. Olivia and Louise, welcome to the show. It's great to, it's great to have you on um, to speak to our listeners. And to kick things off, could you give a brief introduction to Chetwood uh, and your roles and responsibilities at, at the company? So, Louise, I'll start with you on that one. Yeah, great. So, um, Chetwood started in uh, 2016. Um, it got its banking license, its full banking license in 2018 um, and has been scaling up and pivoting on certain products since then really. So now we're at about 300 people. We have two offices. The head office is based in Wrexham, which has obviously got a bit more popularity um, of late. And um, we've got a London office as well. So we've got people, we've got people all around the country. We've got them um, in the tech space, financial services, obviously. So we've got a, a plethora of uh, qualifications and experience that we've got within our within our business at the moment. But yeah, things have um, things have been going well. We've been growing as we've uh, as we've gone through the 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 past. So since twenty sixteen, there's seen a significant increase from starting with our um, co founder Andy, who's still our CEO, to now about three hundred people. And I'm going to come back follow up for you in a minute, Louise, about what it's like to be a CHRO in a, in a scale-up company, but I'll let Olivia introduce herself first. Thanks. So, yeah, my name's Olivia. I'm the Colleague Engagement Lead at Chetwood. I look after everything employee engagement, which includes DE&I initiatives as well as wellbeing. Um, I've been here for two years now, so I've seen a big chunk of the change. And, hey, it's a great environment. It's never ended. It's never changing, so it's great. Fantastic. So, so Louise, I mean, firstly, we have quite a lot of Amer- American listeners. So, I mean, it might be interesting to talk a little bit about Wrexham, obviously, just to start uh, as well. Um, but also maybe as part of that, maybe if you can share maybe some of the um, the challenges or uh, of what you love about being uh, the CHR, Chief People Officer in a, in a scale-up company. Um, I would say it's uh, the variety is definitely there. Um, there is a, there, it's relentless. There's um, the... It's really exciting because you never every day is completely different, and because you are exposing, um, I suppose, the business to new things all the time. So I would certainly say for the likes of my team, who are, you know, um, relatively young as far as experience is concerned, that the exposure that they get to the are, you know, level talking a bit about changing values, putting new values in place, the um, the. I suppose the ramp up of your experience that you can get in a scale up and a startup is so significant. It also means that you can go from strategic to actually getting your hands dirty with, you know, are the facilities still working, even though facilities doesn't fall under you sometimes, you know, it's sort of, I think you, it, the scale of what you have to deal with is so significant of growing a business. So you have to make sure you've got all of the people aspects, the legal aspects in place, the engagement to, um, to fundamentally, drive the business forward and, and, and build the team um, as the business is growing, but then you have to make sure all the day-to-day activities are still taking place. So I would say um, it's relentless, it's fun, it's really challenging. Um, and it does mean that I think, you know, you're learning every day, even though I've been in HR 20 odd years now, and it's um, it's still the exposure to certain things that you get sometimes you go, oh, I still need to ask a question about that or I'm still learning. So I think even though my team are getting it, I'm still getting it as well on a day-to-day basis, which I absolutely love. I think it's great. And and Chetwood has got a brilliant culture. It's got a learning and developing culture. You know, we learn by our mistakes. It's got a great experience and it's got a great fun environment to it as well. That's what you tend to find in startup scale-ups. The sense of humour is key, should we say. <laughs> That's uh, I'd, I'd agree with that because we're we're in a, in a startup um or not startup small company ourselves. But I would I highly recommend anybody in their HR career to actually give it a go because, you know, I've worked in larger companies as well, and they're great. But it never tests you as much as when you're doing a startup scale up and in a smaller business. It definitely tests you a lot more than it would do. And of course, um, Wrexham's on the map. It should be, it's always on the map as far as I'm concerned in the, in North North Wales, but. Um, it's uh, it's obviously become to prominence recently. I, I, it's been interested. Have you seen a more interest in in the town since um, Ryan Reynolds and uh, bought the bought the football club? Yeah, I mean, Liv lives in Wrexham, so I think it's probably a good one for you to pick up that Liv. Yeah, I live about five minutes from our office, and our office is probably about a two minute walk from the racecourse, which is Wrexham's football ground. Obviously, the Ryan Reynolds takeover has really shook the town up and it's nice to put us on the map especially as it just so happens Chetwood's base there um it's crazy like 
even just going out with your friends and going on nights out and there being tourists there and people asking about the town and things it's crazy but yeah it's fun it's nice and i would say from a from a, a talent um, acquisition point of view um Wrexham is more of an attraction point now than it than it probably was previously so it's helpful you know if we're recruiting around the country we don't have to tell them where Wrexham is as much anymore so people knew where it was but even everybody everybody knows where it is now which is to be fair from a HR point of view with the talent acquisition it's a great help so thanks Ryan <laughs> yeah yeah and and you'll be pleased to know that I think this is going to be nearly the 200th episode of uh, the digital HR leaders podcast and it's the first time we've had a Hollywood star on, even if he's not on in person. Um, we've mentioned uh, Ryan Reynolds, so that's 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 really cool. Um, so, Olivia, turning to you, you know, at Chetwood, uh, I understand you've recently embarked on your people analytics driven insights journey. Can you share with listeners a little bit more about the journey so far and, and maybe how it was an, and why it was initiated? Yeah. Um, so our people analytics journey really started about 12 months ago basically when Louise joined the business. <laughs> um, so for people analytics wise, our main source until recent was through our HR information system. So from this system, we pull pulled all the basic functional people analytics, such as demographics, age, turnover, all good things like that. Um, we also use an engagement survey provider alongside this, which was run on an annual basis. The survey that we use itself was a really rigid system. We waited a super long time to see results. And ultimately, by the time we got the results, all our employees were disengaged and the results, they were pointless. We'd had turnover, people had moved apartments, things like that. And we knew we basically had to start again, even before we'd made a change. So over the past few months, we've um, partnered with Cult Tramp, and since then, our whole outlook on people analytics has completely changed. Um, Cult Tramp itself, obviously, the system it provides immediate results, which is something that we really needed in Chetwood to drive change. We had a big gap in knowledge of employees not really trusting and engaging with us in the sense that we were going to make an impact based off our survey. So the partnership with Cult Tramps really changed our outlook to go to a data driven culture. Great. And 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 for a turn to you, Louise, Olivia, you know, you've mentioned you've been on this journey for around 12 months. What have you learned personally about kind of building people analytics, I guess, within a, within a company? So it's been crazy. Like I said, I've been here two years and this is my first role in HR and moving to Cult Tramp where people analytics is so prominent. It's really given me the insight and I think it's given Chet with the insight of how important that data is to make valuable changes. Moving away from HR obviously being a gut feeling intuition, oh people want development, people need a new performance management management system. Having people analytics has really given us that driver to make valuable change, which especially for Chetwood and the rate it's growing has been so valuable. Brilliant. And Louise, obviously, it sounds like you were the catalyst for, for this change uh, when you came in a, in a year ago. And obviously, I understand you're still in the early stages of your journey and, and interesting that and understandable, actually, in a scale up that engagement is so, so key. And that's something where you can make a real difference in HR. It would be great to learn how, you know, how the, this, more, this more data driven approach has impacted your HR strategy so far. Yeah, I mean, so when I started, we um, we from, as life says, we got the basic data together. So the beta absence, nutrition, you know, what did our demographics look like when people were leaving? How long were they leaving for basically? And, and fundamentally, so the first 12 to 18 months of our HR strategy has all been based on our foundational aspects. So I'm a big believer. And if you do the basics well and you do the simple things, great. That's what people are looking for. Do you recruit them well? Do you give them the information? Do they know where they're going? Have they got clarity? The basics really make a difference. And I think the data that we show, we we drew, which with Love's help, we drew at the beginning, showed us that we needed to spend the next 12 to 18 months just focusing on, you know, things like role profiles, things like um, a big one that we did was new starters. And it sounds really simple and a bit trite to say, have you got a corporate induction? Well, we didn't. We've put one in. 
Um, and I think for me, the, the, the essence of that is looking at people's time to competency. So the quicker you onboard people, and I don't just mean recruitment, I mean when you onboard them in the business, they've started on day one, how long does it take them to feel comfortable? Do they know what they're supposed to be doing? So the induction part of that, and then Culture App came in and we could do a, you know, a probationary period sort of engagement survey about how well it went. So we could measure how well that was working. What I'm hopeful for as well in, in a, um, we, as we build this data up over the next foundation, certainly on the new starter piece, is that um, our average length of service when I started was, say, two years. When we, um, if we build a time to competency point and new starters are going, have we got them up to speed? Have we got the clarity with everything else? You know, we are a small business people. We are, we don't expect them to leave to, you know, bigger and maybe better things, etc. from a career development point of view. But are they staying with us longer because we're delivering what we need for them? And I think the data that we got to begin with drove a very, some people would say a very basic HR strategy, which was do the simple, small and the simple things well. Use the new starter uh, pack as an example, basically. Get them on board, get the time to competency, make them feel comfortable. The more productive as quickly, uh, quicker, um, they build an emotional connection to the business quicker, which means they're likely to stay with us for, for longer because they, they, they enjoy themselves, they want to, they get what they need to. So I would say the data-driven initially was all about 12 to 18 months, let's build the foundations, make sure everything, you know, do the basics well. Moving forward, I think with the partnership we've got with Culture Amp, when we get a more rounded view, when we've got develop and performing, we'll have a more connected link. And, and I know we've got a question about talent management and de employee development coming up as well. And that's where I think we can add more value. So that's probably the next stage in the strategy. Basics doing well, you know, time to hire, cost per hire, etc. initially now, and then let's move on to the next one. So the data drove our foundational strategy to begin with. So again, not particularly exciting, but definitely needed and definitely significantly made a difference to the business uh, to start with. So. No, no, that's really helpful, Louise. And, you know, and, and there's enough academic research that's been done that say that people typically, most the biggest reason why people leave their jobs is, is because of perceived lack of development. So by connecting, understanding engagement, you, you can connect that to development. And I love the way that effectively helps you target your learning and development as to where people want to learn. Um, I think that's really interesting. And also very interesting as well that, you know, it sounds like through Culture Amp, you're able to connect, you know, engagement to, to learning and development and then to performance. So you can start to understand, you know, if we, if we, if we invest in, in career development, do we get performance? Do we get people to stay? Are they more engaged? And that kind of nice, nice sort of sort of triangular kind of relationship between those three. Um, very, very interesting. So, so Olivia, turning to to you uh, and appreciate your just over a year or so into this journey, how have uh, these insights shaped uh, the company culture at Chetwood? And I ask that because in the penultimate before episode, that's not even proper English, David, so I'll start that again. In the episode two episodes ago with Didier Elzinger, the CEO of Culture Amp, he actually shared some of the research that they've been doing recently across all the companies that they work with, the data set they've got. And they found that investing in engagement and company culture has a 300% ROI, which let's be honest, we all want some of that. So again, on that, Olivia, how are these insights helping shape the company culture at, at Chetwood? Yeah, so when I looked at this, I really stripped it back. And from where we were as a business before we started our journey on people analytics, I think the main change that we should be really focusing on is the level of trust that we've actually gained from employees from moving from a culture where we kind of just did what we thought was right to a data driven culture. There's two like prongs really to this point. Half of it is now that employees trust that we're doing the right thing and employees now also trust that we are going to deliver which I think has been extremely beneficial for us to get buy-in from the business. Um, as of today we have run two engagement surveys, we've run our um, flagship engagement survey in April and then a Pulse one in October and we can say that out of both of these engagement surveys, we have made so many positive changes to the culture at Chetwood and employees are seeing us make these changes which they have asked for. And I think that is the main point really to shout out here is we are trusted as a HR team and what more can you ask for when you're trying to deliver change? Yeah. And and I guess as 
the longer you that you do this, you'll be able to see the impact on things like retention, on um, move mobility within the organisation, I guess, and you know potentially the link with with performance as well. Um, really, really interesting. And it sounds that you move from what was quite a rigid um, form of measurement once a year, as you said, it took a long time to 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 then get the results and then to get the actions out. And often, as you said, it it can be too late then because things move fast, particularly in a scale up. But by getting access to real time data, be able to do more frequent surveying of of employees, and because employees see or colleagues, as you call them, sorry, colleagues see that you are actually taking action on what they're saying, that helps build trust and then more participation, I guess, as 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 well in 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 what you're doing as well. So yeah, really, really interesting, um, really interesting actually on that. And you know. At, at, insight 222 you know we've been since 2020 now doing an annual research of, of people analytics across a number of organizations and i think last year in, in 2023 it was 271 companies participated in the research and it kind of explores the the growth and value of people analytics in organizations and in that report we found that people analytics is increasingly adding value to business and senior uh, leaders at board level as well have you found this to be the case with the work that you're doing? And if so, in what ways have you seen data enhance your influence as an HR function uh, and gain buy, buy in with, with other business leaders and, and, and maybe even the CEO, Andy, that you mentioned as well earlier? Yeah, I mean, the first thing we did, so when we did the engagement survey with Culture Amp, and as Liv, uh, Liv said before, because we got real time data, we got information really quickly. What came out from that survey from the main survey last April was the fact that people wanted more development. Um, I, f I find that a great question to ask, but also it's like a big bucket that, what does that mean? And um, who means it? And it means something very different to every person you talk to. Development, it can mean, I want to do better in my current job. Some people might, you know, they might be a financial service analyst, but they also then want to learn knitting. It could be something completely different. Some people want to then get promoted. And so, you know, it, it's, it, it's a really great question to ask. How to answer it from a HR team perspective is very difficult because you can't necessarily answer it correctly to everybody. So the next step for me, which was I think is really key, is making sure that colleagues own their own development journey and they take responsibility for it rather than a manager giving them what they think it needs to needs to do in order to develop them. And also managers second guessing everybody wants to be promoted, everybody wants career development. So what Liv and I worked on was putting uh, the Culture Ramp module in called Develop, which does exactly what we wanted it to, which was everybody has their own Culture Ramp account. Every colleague then can put in a development request and say but what they want. It's very specific. It helps them narrow down about what it's for. Is it to be better? Is it to be promoted? Is it to do something different? Is it what is it? And then it enforces the manager then or the line manager to have a conversation with them to have that to to you know to speak to them about it what that system does is give us the data to actually say this many people want development opportunities to promote this many people want development opportunities to be better in the current job so what that then does is we can take it out and say any of the specialist technical things that people need to learn say in finance we then let the business partner speak to the finance team and say okay so then this is what they're looking for because that's technical very specific but from our team perspective we can from a hr we go OK, then what do people generically want? Is the leadership skills that they want? Is it, uh, you know, well-being support? Is it um, is it more how they get people on board, how they motivate people? And then that develops us into either a lunch and learn annual calendar that we can give to everybody. A more specific, um, you know, development course. We brought in um, one called Big Chats, Little Chats, and it was a partnership with a company called Laughology, who were amazing and um, very great for our culture. They... Um, they came and did a you know a development course with our line managers to say not about the what you have to do more about the how you have to do it um and that so that allowed us basically that data said that this is what you need to do this is how we want to do it um and therefore you know the cost associated that was an easy win about how you get that approved basically because this is what we need this is what they're asking for you put it together um, it allows us to budget for the next year as well. So when we've got all these development opportunities, you can go, this is what people are looking for. What's the best way to achieve that? And then we can we can budget for it accordingly. 
from a talent management point of view, we're probably not quite there yet. Um, I, the, the plan is when we launch Perform with Culture Amp and we have the whole three, we have Engage, Perform and Develop. The information that we get from that will be linked into our um, quarterly talent management process that we are commencing in conjunction with that, so we're not there yet, that will hopefully allow us to, the data that I believe will come out of that is, if we give them this development, we look at the performance management element of it, then how many are promoted, how many do we give different opportunities to, how many have we got a succession plan for, um, and long term it can even see, you know, financial services and tech, you have a lot of males in senior positions, if you do this right, you can help with the gender pay reports, etc. the gender pay gap in order to make it more, you know, more balanced, should we say. Totally agree. Yeah, then Olivia, I think you've got something to add to that, yeah? Yeah, just off the back of what Louise was saying, um, as a business, we've got a really great example of how we've used people analytics to drive that influence. So about 18 months ago, we acquired another business, which meant that we'd obviously had two sets of values running side by side each day. We realised really quickly, especially as being all under the same roof, that we couldn't carry on with two sets of values. So over the past basically a year now, um, I spent a lot of time gathering qualitative data off employees through research sessions and things like that about what they wanted and what they wanted to live and breathe really daily as a business. We then also match this with the quantitative data that we got from the engagement survey to establish that one, we needed a reset and we needed it quick and two, what this reset would look like for the business. We gathered all that data and put it into one pack and took it to agree with our executive team to decide one, what the values would be, how it would shape the business and the culture and how we can really embed it and live and breathe it really in every decision we make going forward. Obviously the values reset was extremely important for our culture. Employees now feel that they are all striving from the same goals. And this also goes back to my point on how people analytics improve trust within Chetwood. They all are aiming for the same goal that starts from the top and it goes all the way down. Now that's a really good, good example. And I think to your point, Louise, it's as well earlier on that it's, you know, you don't, it's the, you don't you don't just make the decision based on data, but you also want decisions to be informed by data. So even if a senior leader decides to do something different, at least they still made that decision based on data, whether they've used it or not. And I think a great example there, Olivia, you know, particularly in, you know, in scale up organisations, you, you, you know, the culture change, can change and the values that the organisation has may need to evolve over time as well, particularly, obviously, when you make an acquisition. Um, you know, and, and using data to inform the decision around that and involving the people who are part of that in, in that conversation is, 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 is very important. You know, a really good example there. I mean, one of the questions that, that we get a lot, you know, I get a lot when I'm speaking at conferences is, is you know, is people analytics important in a, in a smaller organisation? And I don't know what you two would say, but I think it's arguably even more important because actually, you know, if we've got 300 people, 0.33% of the firm is, is one person, you know, so whereas if it was in a bigger organisation, that's not the case. So I, I don't know if you talk to Louise with particularly maybe about how the impact that it's helped you have at, at the at the board level and with the CEO by actually bringing data to the conversation. Yeah, I mean, for me, that what data does is it's a bit, it's a bit like a finance department. It takes the emotion out of it and it takes the what if out of it for me. So data drives your decision you've you've there's still a you know um i suppose a a personal element that you need to do as an overlay however it does take any of the why we're doing it out of the question they're not asking the why why do we need to do an engagement survey why do i mean we had great buy-in from our senior leaders anyway to begin with uh, but what it is doing is it's just showing the accurate and accurate reflection of the why why we're spending that money, and then the um, the measurement of how success it is, because then you come back round it. What I'd say, add on to Liv's point before, is all of the things that we do will will reflect one way or another, hopefully positively, one way or another in the initial data pack that we put together, which was in relation to absence, attrition, um, you know, uh, time to hire, etc. All of that, our performance will always be be 
put back into it. But for me, data is, it just, it takes all of the emotion uh, because people are one of the, um, one of the most costly elements of any business, just not from a, you know, a salary point of view, but a productivity point of view. And so therefore all the data that comes out of that shows you what you're performing and what you're not performing as well. So for me, the buying comes, as I say, we have great support from our senior leaders and from a people aspect, but it just makes it clear. One thing it does do though, is as soon as you express and you put some more data, clearly they want more. <laughs> so, and they're asking for extra rings. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's making sure that you can compete and keep up with that, I suppose, the, the, the request that we're getting for it. But I think it does from every other department has to put um, data behind why they're doing it and success measures behind why they're doing it. And people teams should be no different. And actually, you said a really important point. Every other business function brings data to the conversation. Um, and so I, well, why shouldn't HR? And actually, now that you're doing that at, at Chetwood, I'd be interested, Louise, how, how do you believe has, that using analytics has changed that broader organisational perspective of the HR's function um, role and the value it provides at Chetwood? Yeah, look, it, it makes, um, I think it gives more credibility to the conversation that we're having because you're right, smaller organisations, a lot of the time it's the emotional connection and they want to go with that and they're moving at pace. So sometimes moving at pace can, can cause them, I'm not saying check with them this, but can cause them to make some, you know, errors in, in, in approach for why they want to do because everyone believes something, whereas the data backs that up. So it just makes it more real and credible. Um, I think it measures our success because data is one thing to inform a decision, but then the output of it to say whether it's been successful or not validates your decision or not, as the case may be. You can say, oh, actually, and it's okay to make mistakes as long as you know you've informed them or you go, okay, we did that because of that. Let's not make that mistake again. But for me, it's not just the initial data to inform the decision. It's the data afterwards that says whether that's been right or wrong or or actually it's taking you in a different direction because a business has done something different as well. So it's the follow up from it that for me is arguably more important than the initial one as well. But from a smaller organization, you know, as I say, I've worked in larger, larger organizations. I believe in people analytics throughout because I think it's a way of saying how well we're, we're performing as, a, as not just as a business, as a team. Um, and I just think, but in a smaller organization, it can have more of an impact. And I think one of the measures, I guess, of success is the fact that you, something you mentioned earlier, that the, the, when you bring in data, the expectation level goes up as well. And, and it sounds from, from, from what you said that the expectation levels have, have gone up as well, which can be a, a blessing and a curse, obviously. Um, I, look, look, it's hard to say what they thought of it previously, because obviously Liv and I probably weren't here as well. But I would like to think that the fact that we've come in and we've got more credible data to justify why we've done things and what we've done means that our our team is is seen as delivering high quality change for the business on time. And then you're seeing the outputs. And also, it also shows that we are um, critical of ourselves about the the projects that we do so how well have they done and what's the deliverable for it how's how's it performed so i would say that the, the it brings more again it brings more credibility um i don't know obviously previously because it, because it wasn't done but i think it certainly heightens the um the impact that a, a good people team can have on a business that is changing constantly because it can stabilize some of those spikes that happen because when a business is in scale up and is changing obviously attrition does go higher than you'd expect so it's a cost to the business if you can stabilize some of those people aspects and show it by data then actually you're showing how how much value you're adding to a a growing and ever-changing business so i would i would suggest it's a, it shows us as a more credible team it's interesting you say that louise because one of the things uh, that we found in the research at insight 222 last year um, in the people analytics trends um, study was that those HR or those people analytics functions that had a strong partnership with finance also tended to be those ones that were delivering a, a value on a consistent and sustainable basis. So um, that relationship with finance is so important. Yeah, I like it because it's a challenge, I think, for our team, you know, there's a constant challenge, but to always do better, it's, it's nice to have that as well. And it also makes you think, Certainly when a finance person, because I think our finance person also challenges not just our people data, but tries to you know, ask us questions about making that more financial, which is the right conversation to have 
and they they'll help us get there really basically so yeah i think it's good that's good yeah and, and the last thing you want is your finance team undermining your data at the at the, at the table <laughs> um so so louise maybe to share with some of your peers that are listening for you know for hr leaders that are seeking to gain buy-in from senior leadership on the value of people analytics what advice would you offer based on your experience yes i i would agree because they do i also think that it helps bring more credibility finance you know they're well established they know the numbers and it is all about cost and certainly in a scale up it's about profitability how quickly you're going to get there what you're going to do and a finance team can help a people team do that well or not as the case may be and we are great we do have a great finance team no it's, it's very exciting it sounds like a very sensible strategy and as you said you know help to help you scale that the work that you've already done is just you know getting those line managers heavily involved is is, is going to be really important i think you, you you need to start with the basics don't try and do but don't try and do anything too fancy don't try and over egg it start simple and small start with the basics that people will understand which is who have you got in your organization how much is your salary bill <laughs> Um, how much are your benefits costing you? Um, look at your absence because that costs you. Look at your turnover. Look at your length of service of how many people, how long people are there with you because then that's obviously a knock on impact onto your cost of recruitment, etc. Look at those basics first because there's no point in doing development and ultimately engagement until you sort that out and then follow on. You gain buy in by showing the basics of what you can do. And you just need to start somewhere. And that data is really easy to get. Every HR system has that. So you don't need anything fancy. You know, I think Culture Ramp is fabulous, but you don't need that to start. You just need to start somewhere and show it to, and, and show it to somebody. And you're right. I would suggest that you, your first pack that you're doing, walk it through with your finance person, because what they'll do is they'll help you add the costs into it as well, um, which legitimizes your deck. So... I can't believe we've we're actually on to the last question now. You know, it's got flown by. The time's flown by. And this is the question that we're asking everyone in this series, and I think it probably touches a little bit on some of the work that that you that you've just been talking about, um, both of you. You know, what are what are what are your top three ways that that HR can play a pivotal role in in creating a, a thriving organisational culture? And I think Louise, you're you're going to take that one, I guess. I am. I think, well, clearly we're talking about people analytics and I'm quite passionate about that. So I'm going to say making sure people analytics is, it's not just for the board. It's great going up, but coming back down. So a bit like what Liv said, managers owning their own data that they've got in analytics and driving forward in their own specific areas. So I think people analytics is, is a real key to, to us. The next one would be line managers. I think line managers, and, and, and for once of a bit different phrase, sort of like the middle chunk, I think are crucial to any organizational culture because they have they're managing people so they're creating their own culture in their own teams but they've also uh, they're being managed or being led by more senior people so that they're like the sandwich you know and it's a really difficult role to do um, and I think helping managers um, understand the role they play informing them of, of what they can and they can't do, I suppose, giving them the tools to be able to do it, empowering them to be able to lead their team as opposed to just managing them um, in the realms of it. I think they fundamentally can create, a, can make or break a culture. Um, so I think that's really key. Um, and finally, I think HR, more at, um, probably a senior level, is making sure that people have clarity, clarity of expectations, clarity of expectations for them in the role, them in the business, making sure the business are giving clarity to people saying that this is the plan, this is the vision, this is the mission, this is what we're going through. And I think HR can play a really key role in making sure that everybody has clarity about the part that they play in it. And that fundamentally impacts culture. And ultimately, I suppose it's about understanding what are you trying to achieve as a business? What are the key um, strategies that you've got as an, as an organisation at that time and connecting it from a people perspective and let's be honest there's always a people element to it and then thinking about okay well what, what insights that we could provide that will actually help support informed decision making around this perhaps and so Olivia turning to, turning to you um, I appreciate you still in the infancy of, of, of using people analytics although you know it sounds like you've made a, a lot of progress in a, in a short period of time 
but I'm I'm curious to 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 learn more about how you see the role of people analytics evolving at Chetwood. Are there maybe any future initiatives that you're excited about? For me personally, um, people analytics obviously involved in this, but it's teaching line managers the importance of people analytics and how to really drive change in their area. So for example, um, our engagement survey, each line manager has a individual report based off their engagement score. At the moment, it's obviously a concern that managers don't understand this data. What does it actually mean? So for me personally, I am really excited and keen to get in there with our line managers and make them the drivers of change in their areas. We've mentioned before, change doesn't just come from the people team. It has to start with individual teams and it has to start with their managers. So that's something I'm really going to be focusing on over the next few months is getting line managers to care and buy in as much as people analytics as we have. Um, we're we're going to do our final stage of our culture amp piece. So we're going to, I'm really excited about perform um, being launched in April as our start of our new financial and performance year. So I'm really excited about that. And as you say, we've done a lot over the last 12 months. So I think our focus needs to be in the next stage of ours is embedding it. Don't try and do anything new and fancy. Let's embed that. Let's make sure that the people analytics coming out of develop, engage and perform link into the basic people data, people analytics that we've got. And we produce that next stage of the pack. But back to Liv's point, land managers owning those three elements of that is crucial to the next stage of our success as a people team, as a business, et cetera. So I think the next year will be about embedding those things that we've launched rather than trying to launch anything new. So I'm excited about seeing where we can get to in the next 12 months with what we've got now by um, coaching and, and getting managers engaged into it. No, no, really, really, really good. Really, really good. Love that. Love, love those ones, Louise. I think some really good practical guidance, I think, for for other HR leaders listening to this episode as well. So we've we've come to the end of um, of our discussion. Olivia, Louise, thanks so much for for joining today. Can you let listeners know how they can follow you, um, and under, and learn more about the work you're doing at Chetwood? And maybe Olivia, if you've got any advice for people looking to get tickets to the racecourse ground, maybe you can add that in as well. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah, so we're both on LinkedIn. Just our names: Louise Miller and Olivia Edwards. You'll also find Chetwood on there. Um, our personal pages are a lot about the culture within Chetwood and what we're doing to strive for change. And then our Chetwood, our banking page, is obviously a little bit more about our products. But there is loads of information on there to go have a look at. Perfect. Well, thank you very much for sharing your, your story so far um, with listeners of the Digital HR Leaders podcast. I'll be interested to see how that story develops, particularly as you implement the perform piece um, of, of culture amp as well in, in well in, in in a month or so so uh louise olivia thank you so much for being guests on the show thank you in this series we will be speaking to a range of senior leaders who are pushing a data-driven and digital hr agenda make sure that you subscribe by your podcast app of choice and also via our youtube channel for free and regular interviews with the digital hr leaders of the future